tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John Ryan. He's from Afton, which we won't go that Houston, and attended St. Joseph's and UCD, then went to the University of Arizona, Arizona on a Fulbright Scholarship, and he's an international expert on soil science. Okay, well, well known. So he has spoken to us before. He's taught lecture, he spoke us on Syria for two years ago. And he also spoke last year on crops that has changed the world. Okay, and now I'll ask John to talk tonight about soil and, soil and society perspectives, its history, its impact on history, culture, health, environment, and sustaining civilization. Okay, John, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Thank you very much for your patience. It's Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will. Uh, so I'm very pleased this evening to share with you my experiences as a soil scientist. I, for the last 50 years, that's a long time, I've been dealing with this subject. And I dealt with it on various aspects at night. OK, sorry. Yep. Um, OK, I've touched upon, you still don't hear me? Uh, we'll point out. Hmm? This is, hmm? Hello? Yeah, Okay. So, uh, thank you very much again. I've been dealing with soils as a subject at the professional level for 50 years. Um, so, I'm delighted to share with you some of my experiences on these. Today, today, I will deal with how soil interacts with history, culture, health environment and sustaining civilization. Uh, if we think for a while, sorry, I, this thing's a bit messed up. Uh, what does soil do for us? We grow crops in it, we're sustained by it. We depose or, uh, dispose of waste in it. It uh, uh, purifies our water. We provide land for recreation. We build cities on it. We build roads on it. And at the end of the day, we will all end up in the soil. So it is surprising that though it touches on our lives in so many ways, there's generally not a whole pile of awareness of it. Don't see headlines in the paper or in the TV or in the media about soil and how important it is for us. So, it's like many things around us, we just take it for granted. And I'll begin with a quotation from one of the authorities in soils. He says, most people are soil blind. They walk upon it, they gaze upon it on the horizon, they gain pleasure and sustenance from its bounty, but soil goes unseen and unappreciated. Modern life conspires to remove us from any connection or awareness with the soil. And when you think about it, that is true. Most of us live in cities. We are not connected with agriculture. We, we don't do anything with the soil. We don't think about it. But the strange thing is, not only are we not aware of it, we have a negative view, those who think about soil. And what's something I, I hate when I go to the US and when I deal with uh, the media, they call soil dirt. It isn't dirt, but it's got into the vernacular. They talk about things being dirty, dirt pool, dirt sheep, and then in mud, mud slinging. So soil has a negative connotation. Even the word something being soiled, it is negative. It's in contrast to terms like the salt of the earth. OK, I, on the aspect of people being knowledgeable, uh, how many people here know that 2015 was the, the year of soils? Not many. And that this decade, from 2015 to 2025, is the decade of soils. Excuse me. The goal of, of my lecture is to rectify the issues that are implicit in the title. So that when you walk out of here tonight, you say, Jesus, I didn't know about that. I didn't realize that. So that's the, the, my ambition. The focus of the lecture is 
about soil in relation to human beings. What we do with it. Now, there are many people who say the soil has feelings and all of that. There's a lot of nonsense. Soil has been around for millions of years and will be there long time after we are gone. The perspective then is how we use it and how we, we manipulate it to serve our needs. Going back to the 16th century, Leonardo da Vinci said, we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil on the foot. That's a very big statement, important statement from such a luminary as him. And it's actually true today. One of the big frontiers in soil science, indeed in any science, is soil itself in the future. And I'll explain that later. So let's have a little outline. You need to know where I'm going. Am I just rambling around like Alistair Cook used to do? Like in, we travel in Ireland as crossroads. The signposts, that's where we're going. So this evening where I'm going, I'm going to talk about soil research. How do we get the information that I and colleagues like me have? What is the soil? Do anyone, do we think about it? Maybe farmers who work it, they think about it. And then we will uh, explore early perceptions since the beginning of time, how people thought about soil. And one thing that has preoccupied us uh, from time immemorial is how plants grow. And you'd be surprised how many people don't really know how plants grow. What are the basic principles? And I will mention some of the milestones in that whole process. Then we will move on to something that's things that are immediate contrast, talked about them the last time, uh, food security, uh, and I'm going to go to something else, and that is erosion and soil conservation. I've been dealing with this for many years. That impinges upon society's history. And we'll consider also human health. We never think when we go to the doctor, to the pharmacy, what is the connection with soil? There is a very big connection. And then we'll in touch upon climate change. That's everybody talks about climate change now. Uh, it's a reality. And I'll try to explain to you how, how connected soil is to climate change. And we'll finally end with cultural aspects. And I've done a lot of reading for this uh, and various things that you probably wouldn't know. You wouldn't come across this in, in your daily lives. And finally, we'll end up with what are the challenges for society in the future? The, the challenges for science and the challenges for soil science in particular. And how do we advance knowledge? How do we gain knowledge? I might, at uh, outset, say there are a lot of people like me around the world, soil scientists. And the last count we got from the International Union of Soil Science, about 50,000 of them. And, and a lot in the United States and China and the major countries. We don't have too many here in Ireland. Where would you find them? You'd find them in Johnstone Castle, a few in UCD, and a few around the place. You could almost count them in one hand. So these are the people who do the research, find out new knowledge, uh, applied and basic. And how do they communicate the knowledge? It's through the normal media, through uh, scientific publication and uh, books and so on. How do we get that information? The, the early scientists got a lot of information from observing with their eyes. They went to the field and they saw things. And they made conclusions, some of which were valid even after many hundreds of years. The scientists that uh, one would deal with, they, they work in the laboratories, a lot of them doing experiments and greenhouses. They grow plants at greenhouses. They have field trials. And there are some institutions in the world that have very, very long-term greenhouse, oh, sorry, uh, long, uh, long-term trials. Rothamsted in England has a trial going since 1843. And there are about five or six of them in the United States going on for over 100 years. Now, those trials tell us an awful lot about history, how the soil has changed, how we have influenced the soil. Okay, um, right. Now, you might question, uh, what's my connection with it? I was in Tucson a couple of weeks ago, and a lady said, I Google your name, and 
uh, you teach, but what do you do? Do you do any research? So I, I have been doing a lot of research. When I started out in UCD um, in 1967, just over 50 years ago, uh, my research was agricultural. I worked on phosphate fertilizers and the chemistry of liming. This was a very important practice uh, in Ireland. It's less so now. And anybody who's a farmer understands the benefit of liming. Uh, but then, and all research at that time on soils in Ireland was concerned with agriculture. Then I moved to the United States uh, in 1971, and that was, for me, a paradigm shift. A big change in my thinking, and I worked with a professor who was the first person, I think, in the world to talk about carbon. It's now everybody is talking about carbon in the soil and the atmosphere. But he documented the, the global resources of carbon and how it might affect the climate. Another aspect that he worked on was gases, uh, harmful gases in the atmosphere and how soil can absorb them. Many of you remember the protein factory here, the terrible smell that used to be offered. And I told him about that. And he said, it's very simple. He said, a, a filter from uh, peat or soil will solve that problem. Of course, it did. OK. Um, and I did a few other things in Arizona connected with irrigated agriculture. But it was primarily the environment. And 1971 was the beginning of the environment movement in the United States. The EPA was set up in 1971. Then I moved to the Middle East, and that was a defining move, move, movement sorry, in my life. And as a university, I um, tackled a variety of subjects uh, connected with soil and with, uh, with agronomy, and with soil genesis, how soils evolve over time. And my focus was with the main nutrients, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And these are the big ones, and they have more influence than anything else. Then I moved uh, sideways, as it were, to, with the University of Nebraska to Morocco. And our focus there was applying technology to the farmers and working in the field for about five years. And I was in charge of a lab there doing testing and getting the information that we knew in the West out to farmers who needed that so that they'd grow their crops better and they'd make an economic living. Then I took the last movement in my life was to Ikada in Syria. And that was very, very broad. There I came in touch with a lot of disciplines. I moved away from pure soil science. And our focus was on technology transfer and dealing with human societies, cultures. Uh, how do we get information? What are the blocks that stop people from receiving and interpreting information? Uh, while I was there, I got involved, as it, the Middle East is rich in archaeology and culture, um, on a subject of archaeology in some of those ancient sites. And I will explain later how soils can give us an in, an insight into how we interpret bygone civilizations. So my uh, whole focus when I was in my last job for the 20 years was looking at the soil from the soil connected to the crop and to the animal and to human beings. If I had remained here in Ireland, or perhaps in the States, I would have had a much more narrow view of things. Now, how do we study uh, something like soils? You need a very strong background in all of the relevant discipline, uh, soil physics. You need to know uh, how water moves through the soil and how temperature affects the soil, and so on. Chemistry and uh, biochemistry, these tell us an awful lot about what is happening in the soil. My own area was fertility and nutrients. I was kind of focused on growing a crop and growing it efficiently. I did have some uh, bearing on genesis and classification, and we'll so show you some of the, of the soil profiles here. There's one area that I've always had an interest from the historical perspective, and that is uh, conservation. 
as I should mention, the, the science of soils is growing all the time. One new one, uh, it's kind of macabre in some ways, is uh, forensics. There's a centre in Adelaide in Australia where soil scientists work with uh, criminal investigators trying to help solve crime, and it's been very, very successful. There's a, uh, quite a few people throughout the world working in that area. And there is even a new discipline of soil necrology. There are people who look at uh, soils in graveyards and in battlefields because mankind, through disposal of their remains, have changed uh, a little portion of the landscape, which is a graveyard. Now, let's ask ourselves, what is a soil? Just think for a moment, what is a soil? What do you think uh, about it? Well, the common expression is, it's the skin on the face of the earth, the thin skin. And if you look at, as you travel around, you look in the landscape, you find some places in the mountains, there isn't any soil, uh, just rock. And other places, it's very, very deep. Okay, uh, a comment about soil. It's an incredible biological factory. It's teeming with life. I saw a figure just th this morning as I was reading up for this, that if I had a kilo of soil here, just in a little plastic container, I would have probably 50 million bacteria, several million uh, fungi and protozoa, an incredible number. Uh, one figure that stuck in my mind, in an acre foot, if you had an acre of soil down to a foot, how many earthworms would it have? Anyone hazard a guess? They're very good for the soil. They open it up and they, they aerate the soil and they uh, break up the organic matter. Probably about 100,000. So the soil is, again, teeming with life. Uh, what is it made up of? We don't actually see what it's made of unless we break it and with, with water or some other compounds. It's made of sand. We can visualize sand. Silt and clay, which is that very fine microscopic thing. That is the, the element that gives soil its unique uh, properties. But there's something that binds it all together, and that is organic matter, humus. It's, it's a broad term for a huge range of uh, biological compounds. Okay, uh, and, and the soil is not only biologically active, but uh, chemically active as well. Now, when we understand that, we understand why the government or EU has policies about uh, applying fertilizer, when and how it would run off and all of that. You have to understand the basics. Well, how does soil come about? Would anyone have an idea? Well, you probably would think it came from rocks somewhere, and that's true. But the surface of, of the earth has been changed. Even in Ireland, the rocks were worn and, uh, over millions of years, but we had glaciation. It moved it around. So it's very hard to find a soil in any part of the world that was developed from the rock beneath it. It's, so there are many factors that uh, govern how a soil is, is evolved. And I was in Russia not too long ago, and I have great uh, respect for what the Russians did. There was a, a geologist in Russia, and he was asked by the Tsar to uh, put, make a map uh, of the entire empire. And why? Because they wanted to tax people. The people who had the good land, we taxed them more. People who had the bad land, less. And even here in Ireland, uh, we, have, we used to have the Griffith evaluation, which is based on how a, an acre of ground can grow wheat. That was declared unconstitutional uh, about 50 years ago, and rightly so. But as Dr. Chive uh, traveled throughout the whole empire of Russia, he noticed soils changed as he went from one place to another. He knows that soils change in color. He knows that climate change. He noticed the vegetation change from forested area to the shrub area and to the desert area. And he noticed that soils were different on the mountains versus the, the valley. So he came up with the, the principle that there were five factors associated with the evolution of soil. 
At the same time, there was a man in California, Whitney, with the USDA. He came at the same thing. It's like civilization evolving in one place and in another independently. But Dr. Chive and the early Russians made wonderful contribution to our knowledge of soils and geology. Now, you might think, how long does it take to, for, to make soil for nature? Maybe a thousand years just to have one centimeter of soil. So in terms of our lifetime, that is uh, very, very slow indeed. The point being that if we wash it away, it's not going to come back. It's gone forever, as far as we're concerned. So as I will explain uh, later, as we go along, mankind has an extraordinary effect on, on soil, for the good and for the bad. Okay, um, I should mention uh, mapping, uh, mapping and describing soils now goes on in every country. We had a map in Ireland now up to uh, a number of years ago. Uh, now we have kind of digital thing with aerial photographs and, and so on. So there is a map of this country. And most countries do have a map. And they're not only a benefit to farmers, depending on the scale, but to society, the planners, the government. There's a huge variety of soils in the world. Now, we can't speak of uh, soils in the same way we talk about plants or animals. We know that a sheep is different from a goat or from a horse, but soils and times, they merge. There's no abrupt change between one and another. There probably is 50,000 soils throughout the world according to the current classification. There are many systems, historically, to classify soils. The Chinese, very smart fellows, those guys, uh, 4,000 years ago, they had a classification system. Most countries have, have some system. There's the UNESCO system. And, but the biggest one now that has the currency uh, throughout the world is the one from the United States, largely because it's based on what you see and what you measure not what you think uh, is the process by which the soil evolved. So there are many uh, different kinds of, of soils. Then the classification process is a difficult one, uh, but it is very, very effective. So I remember when I took a soils course first in UCD, and the lecturer was standing on the, uh, the podium and working with chalk and showing layers and, and talking about it. I had no idea actually what he talked about. And none of us had. It meant nothing. Something on a chalkboard uh, describing nature. We had to get out and see it. So for you to understand what I'm talking about here, this is what we have here. I, it, I've selected out a few soils. And now this is a pit. You dig a pit. And you get down into the pit and you see the layers and you describe them. So to the trained eye, that means an awful lot. That is about a meter and a half here, this is so type of soil. We have some of those uh, in Kildare and the Midlands of Ireland, uh, in temperate regions of the world, in the United States. You see on top there, it's brownish, it's the topsoil. The more organic matter. And down below, and it's not a wonder, this slide has been reproduced many times, uh, is a layer where the, the clay has been washed down into the bottom and it's accumulated. So that's one so type of soil. Next, Richard. Now, this, just, this shows you that these are cuttings on, on a field. They're not, they're not something that you just post the pictures. They're related to the actual landscape. I could show you many of these, but this is not a lecture entirely on soils. Go on. <coughs> Next. We'll go fast through these because I don't want to. This is a, another one. A lot more organic matter on the, on the top and that whiter layer. Go ahead, Richard. Now, this is another landscape. So the point being is you're getting a, looking at the, the landscape in three dimensions. Go ahead, Richard. Now, this was obviously it's from a dry area of the world. This one it comes from Arizona. See the gravel on top and there's hardly any organic matter. This is from a part of the world, Iraq or Syria, eastern Syria, where you have salinity. It's, it's kind of a river valley that, that salt is on, on top. Go ahead. 
Now, hold it a second. Now, this one is in river valleys. I've seen most of these in, in, in various countries throughout the world. This would, you'd find in the Nile Valley in Euphrates because you see the layers, the sediment from the continuous flooding is there. Now, this is another one in high elevation. It's so cold. We have some of them in Ireland up in the Wicklow Mountains where the soil actually is washed down over time. These are very acid soils. Go ahead. Now, this one, uh, we have, this is like what they call a histosol, which is like peat. We have them. They're in the northern part of the United States and in Russia and so on. Uh, they're very rich in organic matter used for horticulture. Next. Uh, this one is coming. You find this kind of a soil in the southern part of the United States uh, and in China, all across that kind of semi-arid belt. Next. <coughs> Uh, this one is, is from up near Alaska, northern Canada. And in the, in the lower part there, that's frozen. That's permafrost. Go ahead. Now, this is, again, a temperate area. It's not very well developed. There's a lot of stones. We have several like that in Ireland. Go ahead. Now, this is a typical one. Uh, we find a lot of these in Ireland. Again, temperate. You see the rock underneath. Now, this one is a lot of organic matter. In the Ukraine, in, in Russia, you find them in Texas. This, these are very, very rich soils. And they're the wheat-producing soils, Argentina and, and Uruguay. Yes. And again, you see a huge amount of organic matter. And what we are doing when we cultivate is getting rid of a lot of a lot of that organic matter, leaving it off to the atmosphere. This one is a tropical one. We find this in Brazil, on, in the Philippines, places like that. Go ahead. Same. Highly weathered. Weathering and aging proceed much faster in tropical parts of the world because of the high temperatures and moisture all the time. They are not frozen. Okay. Now, this again, another one that proceeds. These are spectacular just to look at, but they do occur in nature. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So just to show you that there are so many different types. There, this one, the last one you show, uh, the darker one, that's full of clay. And it's a very, very difficult kind of, of, of soil to work. It's hard to walk in it. You, it the clay sticks to, to your feet. And they're terrible for, for engineering works, building roads. And they're often very, very deep. They're just disaster. You couldn't have septic tanks or any kind of thing on, on that. So they do appear in many countries. They have very big cracks because the clay shrinking and, and swelling. Go ahead. I think we're, we're OK now. Now, let's move on to the next topic. That's fine. We can leave it up if you want to. Uh, the earliest perceptions. Since the dawn of humanity, soil was associated with the origin of man. Clay was the spring of life. The book of Genesis tells us that Adam, it's, it's a word in, it was equal to soil in Hebrew. I never thought of that. And surprise, surprise, Eve was life in Hebrew. The word humus is so important to, to the soil to hold things together and to the life of the soil. Uh, that has the same root as homo, hence humanity. So we can see then the connection with uh, soil and the evolution of mankind. We are creatures of the soil. And you go to church, you go to Ash Wednesday, and they put the ash in your head. And the priest says, Dust thou art, and, dust thou, and unto dust thou shalt return. In the, in there, there's connection with religions. I, I read a lot of stuff there, and there's a lot of literature. And synthesized in this, it says, earliest humans venerated soils. As it produced crops to sustain them, they didn't know why, but they knew that it was so important that the crops grew. And of course, they thank God. This is the bounty of God. Now, when the crop didn't grow, God was angry. And people like the, the Aztecs and the Mayans, they had to make sacrifices to the gods so that they would uh, ensure that the crop would grow. It's like when the thunder was coming in, in the past, the ancients thought God is, is angry. And uh, a lot of people uh, figured that uh, when a crop failed, it was punishment for their sins. 
there's a huge connection with, the, with religion and soils. And I had one note in the Shinto religion, there are 10 deities associated with soil. Okay. Now, let's look at how people thought. We'll go to the Greeks. Everybody attributes an awful lot of the good ideas to the Greeks and Aristotle. Now, he was a sharp fellow and he taught about a lot of things and great philosopher. And his idea about plants, he started thinking about plants too. He said plants are inverted animals, that they have their heads in the ground and they suck whatever they needed to grow. In some ways, he was right. It's rather colorful language to explain it. Um, but it was a good shot at it anyway. Now, they, there's a huge literature about the Romans. Uh, those guys, uh, as they sat around uh, eating grapes and uh, drinking wine from their leaden goblets, uh, they thought about a lot of things. And, but they did think about where the food came from that sustained the Roman Empire. We were fortunate to live in Morocco, where it was a big center of wheat production, and in the Middle East that supported the Roman Empire. Uh, Virgil, one of the Roman writers, uh, he speaks about the ancient reverence of people for soil and land and the, and the bounty of the land. And connected with that was the growth of the olive. And the olive is a symbol of peace. Now, the two others that have written extensively, Cato and Columella, uh, they described in their writings the high esteem that the, uh, the Romans had for agriculture. Now, the Romans, at the end of that period, if you could kind of say, what did they really tell us? They told us about manures, and they knew the effect of manures on soil. Legumes, growing legumes that fix nitrogen. They didn't know about nitrogen, but they knew it was good for the soil. They knew about drainage. About, uh, and this was very important, they knew that some soils, by cultivating, they became depleted. Message, the soil is not uh, a perfect medium, uh, it runs out. It becomes de de depleted uh, with time. They knew about structure. They even described smells of soil. And if you ever dig new spuds, you know, in the early part of the year, you just get this beautiful smell. It's the actinomites, uh, in myces, in the soil. And that's an indication of a very rich, uh, uh, biologically vibrant soil. So they knew all about that. They knew about salts. They even were able to test the soil by licking it, and they would get the, the effect of salt. Now, salt is, of course, so important to uh, society. Salt, uh, salary, and all of these things come from, the word, from salt. And they also observed, too, that when they burn things, like burn bushes, uh, next year, the grass or whatever will grow better. We observe that too because it's the ash. So they figured something has happened. Okay, now we come to the, uh, the conundrum or the question that had intrigued uh, thinking people uh, for, for generations. How do plants grow? Most people had ideas. They observed things. Some were right. Some were partially right. There was one uh, Belgian uh, scientist, and he said, look, everybody says that if we put water on, on the land or on, in, in soil and grow plants, the plants will grow because of the water. He said, water is the key of life. So he said, I'll prove it to you guys. And so he got a pot, and he put five kilos of soil into it, or five pounds or some quantity, and he measured it. And he put mm -hmm. a willow plant, and he grew it, and he, and he added water, uh, whenever it needed, and for five years. And at the end of the time, he cut the plant, and it weighed 169 pounds and three ounces. And he said, look, now, if it has, the plant has taken something from the soil, then I'll measure the soil. So he measured the soil again, and he found, oh, it's, it's kind of nearly the same. It was out by two ounces. So he made a correct observation, but a wrong conclusion. He said, it's water, very definitely. But that two ounces was the critical thing because that was the mineral element that had been taken from the soil into the plant. Now, there was others uh, who talked about th this plant and they, they rec recognized that there was salt coming out. And 
uh, several of them said, well, salt, there's something in the water that's salty, and that's the element of life. That's the principle of vegetation. There was an English scientist. Uh, most of the scientists at that time were medical doctors. These were the people who were trained in some kind of science or physics. And uh, he said, I'm going to run that experiment again. And I'm going to put water, and he had, he had water, wastewater, kind of dirty water. And he found that the pots that had the dirty water grew better. And he figured there's something in that water which causes the plant to be better. Well, now we're getting a bit close. There was another fellow, uh, he liked, he invented the grubber, Jetro Toll. And he, uh, and he did a lot of things with manipulating and cultivating the soil. And, and he said, when you cultivate the soil, you break it down uh, like you plow and then you harrow and so on, and it gets finer and finer. And he figured that with all this cultivation, the soil will get so, so small that the plant can absorb, the, the, take it in. Now, that, we know that is not true. But uh, at least he was partially right. And then, to complete the story, uh, we had some people who looked at, at the roots of plants and found that there were this rhizobia and that they were able to fix nitrogen. Um, and then there was other people like Priestley and uh, Ingenhaus. They, they looked at how plants uh, interact with the air. And they take in carbon dioxide and give out uh, oxygen. So the story of plant production or crop growth is almost complete in the 18th century. And that brings us to the era of mineral nutrition. We wouldn't be here today, farming wouldn't be viable today without mineral nutrition. And the, the name that's number one in that, and the father of that, well, in fact, there are two, uh, Sprengel, two Germans, Karl Sprengel and uh, Justus von Liebig. And they pr showed that the, the crops need these elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and all of that, which was uh, an amazing at the time because nobody had measured these things. How they visualized that these elements existed. And Liebig, it seems that Sprengel, uh, he, he did a lot of the work and he rightfully should have been credited with finding this, uh, but Liebig was the, the, the more better guy at public relations. And he came up with, Liebig came with a, a principle called the law of the minimum. And for farmers, it's like this. If you need nitrogen and phosphorus, but you don't put any potassium, the crop won't grow. You need all of these elements uh, to be applied to the crop because they all have specific functions. So that was the law of the minimum. And I have a note to myself here that these discoveries, so the scientific age of soils really began in the middle of the 19th century. And it paralleled the growth of the physical sciences, physics and chemistry and instrumentation and so on. We use all these technologies to get where we are in advancing our soil knowledge. Okay. Um, so we're now uh, in, in the era of, we know an awful lot about, we've come a long way uh, about how plants are nourished. And now that brings us to the era of fertilization. In other words, feeding plants. Plants wouldn't grow unless they're fed. They have to get the nutrients from the soil or you have to add it to the soil. They, in the early days, they, they got... Uh, 18th century, 19th century, I uh, got a material called guano uh, from South America. It was dr bird droppings. There was a lot of it there, and it provided phosphorus and nitrogen. But after a time, uh, it, those resources were depleted. It cost a lot of money to bring that stuff uh, from uh, South America. But the defining moment where things turned was in 1843 in, in England. There were two guys called a chemist and his friend, uh, Gilbert and Laws. Uh, they invented superphosphate. It was rather simple. Uh, it was getting rock phosphate and reacting it with an acid, and you get superphosphate. And they built on previous uh, observations in Europe, in battlegrounds. You know, when, can you imagine those battles where thousands and thousands of people died, horses died, and there would be a lot of bones and the bones added to the, the phosphorus. 
So that was, that was a, a finding that, that was so important in, in plant nutrition. And the process is still the same today. It's a little bit more sophisticated, but the basic principle is the same. And th to move on a bit, at the end of the 19th century, uh, the finding of potash mines in Germany and in Canada, but mainly in Germany. That was the, the known agricultural world at the time. And the, another big one completing the, the trio was uh, the Haber-Bosch process. And this was by, again, two Germans. I mean, the Germans made a huge contribution to our knowledge of this science. And they were able to take nitrogen from the atmosphere in an incredible, they won, both of them got the Nobel Prize for it. And um, it might surprise any of you that the air we breathe has 78% nitrogen. It's truly extraordinary. We never think about it. I've asked classes of mine, how much nitrogen in the atmosphere? And people say, oh, maybe 1%, too. It's 78%. It's incredible. Almost the three, four-fifths of the air is pure nitrogen. Okay, and the fixation of that nitrogen, then, is the basis for all the chemical fertilizers we have today. Now, we'll go on to another subject that touches close to us, and that's the food security in contrast. I won't delve too much into it, because he did a wonderful job on it at the last lecture. And let's bear in mind a few comments that virtually all our food comes from land resources. Not from hydroponics. People say, ah, oh, you can grow it in the sea, you can do this and that. No. The reality is that we depend on land for producing our calories. Um, and connected with that, why do we produce crops at all? To feed people. We have 9 billion people uh, by estimation by 2050. That is an awful lot of people. And can we feed them? Not sure. Uh, basically, when we're looking at feeding people, Divide the total number of people by the number of acres or hectares. In 1950, per capita in the world is 0.4, 0.45. In the year 2000, it was 0.22. So it's about 0.15 now. So we're getting smaller amounts of land for more and more people. We need, in essence, as the land base is not growing, we need to produce more from less land. In fact, land is decreasing. How is it de decreasing? Well, there are many ways uh, to consider this. We're building roads on it. We're building houses on it. We're building factories on it. We're building golf courses on it. I, I saw figures recently. The Chinese were very upset. They built 26 golf courses around Beijing. 26, and now we're using up good agricultural land. So this is our problem. We've got to produce more from less land and with, consider all the competing uh, resources. In essence, in the next 30 years, we've got to increase food production. We've got to double it. Now, food quality. We all have opinions on, on food quality. Um, we tend to, in production systems, focus on quantity. Things that you can weigh. If you go to the supermarket, you see things, you get buy them by weight. Quality is not something that is easily defined. The market doesn't always put a price on it. Now, when we consider quality from the uh, um, nutrition standpoint, we must consider all the elements that are in that plant or that plant part that's of economic importance to us. And there are about 50 of them. We've got to consider potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And he, well, I notice we have one vet here. We know that uh, calcium is essential for milk fever and uh, magnesium for grass tetany and so on. Uh, in the 1950s, it might surprise you here that most of the cattle here were deficient in phosphorus in Ireland. I've seen pictures of cattle eating old clothes and that, because they knew somehow that if they eat it, they would get something from these rags. It doesn't happen now because fertilizer has been added and the levels have, have built up. Okay, um, let's move on fast here. Now, 
I'm coming now to a subject that is dear to me, and in Ireland we, we are not too much aware of it. That is the cons soil conservation, soil erosion. Conservation is the antidote for erosion. And I'll, I'll start with the statement from the book that I read recently. The history of civilization is interwoven with the development of agriculture and the relationship of humans and soil. Now, therefore, we have to look at what is erosion? Uh, there are two kinds. There's uh, geological erosion. That always happened. But the, the other one is the one that we can control. It's called accelerated or man-made erosion. And erosion, as I said before, is forever in human terms. Now, when I came to the Middle East, I was landed in a situation where erosion had a major factor in those societies. And... and dictating those civilizations. Let me get with this. Okay. Um, so the whole process of erosion or degradation is a, a broader term, actually began when in, with settled agriculture. When people stopped being hunter-gatherers and started settling in towns and started cultivating. Then the, this process began. Uh, erosion and degradation has been uh, called in the literature the silent earthquake. It's like getting old. You don't get up some morning and say, God, I'm old. You don't. It's happening all the time. Now, look, from a historical standpoint, uh, many of you have made, uh, may have read uh, Jared Diamond's book, Collapse from Easter Island. Now, this was a civilization way out, out in, in the Pacific, there was quite a lot of them, the population increased, but they cut down all the trees. They couldn't bring in any trees from any place else, and the civilization disappeared. There's a wonderful book by Jared Diamond. They, I've been to the Yucatan some years ago, and I observed that there was hardly any soil around, those Mayan pyramids. And it was erosion that was a major factor in having these people, that civilization, disappear. Okay, and as we come to the Middle East, uh, I observed in, in Jordan, in Turkey, uh, in Syria, all uh, very strong uh, evidence of what had happened by man's misuse of the landscape. And particularly in Lebanon, the Phoenicians, they were great traders. They cut down all the trees uh, and, and the mountain, very steep mountains, for their ships and, and exported the timber. There was a cost uh, to it. Now, if any of you have been to Ephesus in, in Turkey, now, I stood there at the port. We're told this was a port. Ships came in, and you could walk across because it was full of sediment. The sea was out uh, a few kilometers. And that was all the sediment that was washed down from the entire watershed. It destroyed uh, uh, the whole port of, of Ephesus. We buried cities in, in North Africa from, from dust, from man's abuse of the land. We find now, how did they try to cope with that? Uh, by terracing. There's terracing in Peru and in Latin America, in other places, and in Lebanon and in Yemen. There are beautiful stone terraces in Yemen that go back thousands of years. And there are other forms of degradation. Um, one was in the old civilization of Mesopotamia, which is Iraq. So they irrigated the land but they forgot to drain it, and so the salt built up, and that culture disappeared. Now, I come to uh, the United States. Some of you may have seen this, this movie or documentary by Ken Burns. Did any of you have seen it? Uh, it's a two-part series. It's about how the settlers had come out in the 1920s. The land was cheap. Wheat prices were good. They came out, and they, it was the beginning of mechanization. And you could see all these tractors moving across, plowing and planting the wheat, and it was great for a few years. Well, what had happened was they plowed it in an environment which is higher temperatures than here, and the organic matter disappeared. The things that held the soil together were gone. And they had a few dry years then, and the, the dust blew. And, and it's an extraordinary uh, uh, film, The Dust Bowl. And if you see in the Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, it's the same thing. Untold human misery because of the folly of, of mankind. And again, if we knew enough about our environment, tailoring our practices to the environment, uh, it wouldn't have happened. 
It, it is described as the biggest ecological disaster in the history of the United States. Uh, another thing is cultivation. I, we have one of the experts on non-cultivation here at the back of the room, so I have to be careful what I say. Uh, in the United States, uh, since they started uh, cultivating the Great Plains, the level of organic matter has dropped about 50%. So that's the impact of tillage. We're, we're slowly destroying the soil. And soil scientists now understand that, and they're trying to do something about it. Uh, the, we have this, this problem of destroying land in other parts of the world. We often think of indigenous societies in Africa and in Asia and being everybody very happy together, lovely and so on. But it isn't. They have destroyed their landscapes too with, with erosion. And a beautiful example there is it's a social thing. Tribalism. You see, when you have a, a tribe, everybody owns everything else. Everything is in common. The tragedy of the commons. We have overgrazing with, by, by sheep and goats, and they, cut, they graze everything, then the rains come and the soil is washed away. You may have seen the news today about the floods, uh, the floods of mud in California. Well, that's predictable. Once you have the, the vegetative cover gone and the rains come, you'll have mud, and it will run off terribly, about 15 people killed in, in that. I, when I went to Lebanon first, I had an old professor who was department head, and he said, John, he said, let me tell you that the goat caused more damage to society than all the wars combined. And I thought, oh, God, he's, he's talking, he's off his, his, his rocker. But actually, there's some point to it. But there's overgrazing. And in some countries, there are a lot more, more uh, animals than there are people. And they value, sometimes in, in India, they, they don't kill the, the cows, but they value the numbers uh, in Kenya and East, East Africa, the numbers of animals. Uh, th that shows you a very important man, you're, a rich man you're standing in society. So having too many animals uh, can be very harmful for the environment. Uh, but mankind has recovered. And the, the beautiful example is the United States. After that uh, dust bowl, uh, uh, President Roosevelt uh, set up the, the Soil Conservation Service. And they started modifying the land, on contouring the land, growing things uh, with different crops, and taking a lot of land out of agriculture. But a whole system of science and technology was around this. And they have export, exported that around the world, the system of conservation, based on an understanding of the principles of uh, hydrology and soil protection. And that leads then to <coughs> soil health. That wasn't heard of 30 years ago. But in the last 10 years, a lot of papers about soil health and stewardship of the land. So we're now kind of uh, coming to where we should be. There's the patron saint of the alternative agriculture. Uh, you would know of him, Richard. Wendell Berry. I have a quotation from him. We do not know how, the, how to value the soil. Its complexity and potential longevity exceeds our comprehension. We must value it beyond what price we put on it by respecting it. So basically what he's saying is, it depends on what economic value you put on the land. <coughs> Excuse me. You, you must consider it beyond that, beyond what you're going to get on the market today. Now, when we come to the environment, uh, what is the environment? The environment is everything around us. Uh, but we must understand the basic principles of chemistry to understand how we affect the environment. Now, when you hear of environment, you think of pollution. Is it just now that that happened? Well, what I read, it's not now. Neolithic farmers in Cumbria, uh, 3,000 years ago, they cleared the forest and they caused the, the algal bloom in some of the lakes around that area. What, how do you explain that? They cut down the forest, uh, all the organic matter started oxidizing, and the nitrogen and phosphorus and everything went into the lake and caused the same problem that we see today in, in the Gulf of Mexico. The, there was a, an example of the Romans cutting, making a road near Rome and causing the same thing uh, a long time ago. Uh, in Australia, this concept of uh, toxic algal bloom uh, was noted in uh, 1853. 
Then we're moving on now to think of the, the modern area and ecology and environment. The term ecology was invented in 1873. This seems uh, a long time ago. Uh, it's a hundred years later the, in, the term environment was used. I remember uh, when I was a student in Dublin, the issue of, of the pollution of Lot Ney uh, was a, an issue. All this green stuff growing, and somebody said, it's uh, agriculture, it's phosphorus runoff. No, it wasn't phosphorus. It was nitrogen and phosphorus from the pig farms there. Now we understand that. Things have, have improved uh, uh, immensely. Now, at, in the 1960s, uh, everybody has heard of Rachel Carson uh, in the Silent Spring. That awakened people to our environment, we've got to respect it and take care of it. Maybe she was wrong in some aspect, but the general gist was correct to heighten awareness of man's interaction with his environment. Now, I have a, a little thing here about Mrs. Thatcher. She was no friend of Ireland, and she was, at the time of the Falkland War, she said, exciting to have a real crisis on your hand, rather than spend half of your life on humdrum issues like the environment. Now, this is the Prime Minister of England considered the environment a humdrum issue. Now, uh, nobody would say that now because it is an issue to, to all of us. And then we come to the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen is pivotal, central to all this discussion of pollution. And we've got to understand how nitrate which is very mobile, it doesn't attach itself to the soil, how that goes through the soil and runs off the soil. And we've got also to understand about manures, how they change, and therefore we can, if we understand all of these things, we can have policies and practices to combat them. There's a, a study in Rothamsted in, in England uh, which has looked at all these various processes and they have come up with uh, very good information uh, on that. I was really surprised when I, I traveled, flew over the Gulf of Mexico one time. I was going to New Orleans, and I looked down. I thought we were coming in, and I didn't see any sign of, of roads or forests, just green, 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 green. And then we saw New Orleans in the horizon, and later I found this is all algal bloom because from the nitrogen and phosphorus and everything from the Midwest. And it's not just farmers. Everyone always points the finger at farmers. You're the crowd that's responsible. No, it is the, the urban. It's the municipalities. Uh, half of the, uh, the towns of Ireland uh, dump sewage directly into the rivers. So we're all responsible. Don't just bl blame the farmers. So at the present time, if we look globally, we are putting about twice the amount of nitrogen into the rivers, and it all ends up in the sea. So it's bound to have consequences uh, for the future. Now, uh, when we talk about nitrate, I remember in the early days there was a figure that said, nitrate is bad for you. It's, it's bad for your health. And they had a number of 50 parts per million. It was written in stone. If you took water that was above 50, then you were a goner. Finished. But it's not true. It's, somebody came up with, with this and said 50, and everybody else took it as, as a fact. And there have been numerous studies now that showed that this is not the case at all. In fact, nitrate is good for you. It's, it's, it is beneficial. We're told first it causes stomach cancer and, and this and that. There's no scientific and medical evidence to support that claim. With respect to phosphorus, and I'm, I have studied that for years and years, uh, that is different in terms of running off from fields uh, to the environment because of its chemistry. Now, if anyone wants to understand what's going on here, there's a lot of work. Most of the work in Ireland is going on in Johnstown Castle on the environment, on nitrogen and phosphorus and so on. Now, pollution is not always bad because years ago when we had the acid rain and, and people had... Uh, they had uh, burned a lot of coal, it went up to the atmosphere, and the sulfur was blown in inland into Europe. And of course, that provided nutrition for forests. So an example of some good can come out of this as well. Now, there are bad things. We, we can have sewage, sludge, and so on, 
put this on the land, but we have to realize that this can have harmful things like lead and cadmium and so on. You've got to be aware of all these constraints. Now, the, the cadmium, I should mention that because cadmium is a constituent of uh, phosphate fertilizers. And there's been a move in Europe recently to stop Moroccan sources of phosphate coming into Europe, and it was purely political. There have been this Rothamsted trial has documented the levels of cadmium for 100 and now, uh, now nearly 150 years. And there's no difference. There's really no danger. This was a political move. And of course, there's uh, a lot of issues like that that are politically motivated. Now, with greenhouse gases, um, Khan mentioned that again. Uh, well, I won't belabor it. Uh, but um, I have to see what are we doing in Ireland about greenhouse gases? I don't think we're doing anything. We're blaming the, the last minister, say, oh, he did a lousy job. And I have a story. Uh, some years ago, here in, in, in this hotel, I was talking to a politician who shall be nameless, uh, and a very important one, and I said, what do you, what do you think of, of climate change? And, and that he said, uh, he said, a few, a few old cows farting. Uh, th that will tell you the level of knowledge at senior government level here. Now, uh, he would rue the day that he had said that, God be good to him. Now, uh, as a soil scientist, uh, I've got to consider carbon. How many people actually know that there's more carbon in the ground, in soils throughout the world, than in the air? And there is. And our challenge as agricultural scientists is to keep it that way and have crops take it from the atmosphere and keep it in the ground. Now, methane uh, is another one of these gases, and it's very harmful. But don't blame the, the old cows and, and so on. As Khan says, we've got to live. People are not going to stop eating meat tomorrow. Uh, not many of us realize that in nature, in the bogs that we have around, that it gives off methane. Most of the rice in the world, in, the, in, in the Thailand and China and so on, is grown under flooded conditions, and it gives off an incredible amount of methane. So we're not going to stop that. There are some things we cannot change. The good scientist is the person who sees what you've got to live with and what can you change. So everything that is uh, man-made is not bad, and nature is not always good. The nitrous oxide is a very difficult one. That's a powerful greenhouse gas. And uh, it's associated with agriculture, with fertilization. And, but with our understanding of the system, we can stop the leakages. The good news is there's an awful lot of research throughout the world on fertilizer use efficiency. We're trying to ensure that what nutrients are put into the ground get into the plant, not off to the atmosphere, not into the river. And that makes economic sense as well for the farmer. There's uh, that with fertilizing practices. Another good development uh, is minimum tillage. We have our world experts sitting there in the, in the back, and we're changing the way we think. We don't need to plow and to harrow and do all of these things. Well, in fact, minimum, and that is, is an old way. We control weeds that way. But th this is a development. Most of the land uh, cultivated in the United States is minimum or no till, the same in South America. Okay. Um, so if we look at climate change on the broad perspective, somebody say, it's going to be good for us, things are going to be warm, and we're going to cultivate land uh, in places that we didn't do before. Well, on aggregate, it's going to be negative because climate has negatively impacting the entire Middle East. It's getting drier, and there's a real problem there. And that gives rise to a lot of social and political instability. The human health, uh, I've touched on this in some of my research over the years, not in a major way. Uh, some things are positive and negative. We have the, the basic principle that rich soils give good nutrition, poor soils, poor nutrition. And there's an area in, in the soil, the geomedicine, the connection with soil and medicine. And from the, it's interesting to look at the historical literature. Uh, the Greeks, uh, they looked, they saw the Certain diseases occurred in certain areas in their country. The Chinese uh, did the same thing in their 
Empire. Now, Marco Polo, uh, he's a guy who traveled from Italy, went right across Asia, and he noticed that in some places there was goiter. People had the swelling here in the neck, a uh, deficiency of iodine. And did any of you know that South Tipperary is deficient in, in, in iodine? Now, we solved that problem uh, because of iodized salt. But if we're looking at print of, I won't say primitive societies, other societies inland, it is a, co a common problem today. Okay. Um, Iodine was ident identified many, many years ago as a problem in France. So uh, anywhere there, the people consume fish, it solved that problem. Um, there's, a, there's a wide literature on many other elements. Selenium is something that I dealt with. In the United States, there's, in North Dakota, the soil is so rich in selenium, it's above the critical level, that the wheat they have there has to be mixed with wheat from another area to bring down the selenium. And in Ireland, there's a few places in Wexford and in Limerick that have above average uh, levels of selenium. Okay, and arsenic is, is another one that uh, we think of arsenic in pesticides and, and so on, and orchards used over the years, but it is a major problem in Bangladesh. And it occurs naturally from tube wells. They dig, put down the well, and it's in the water, and a lot of people suffer from this. It's a major problem uh, in, in developing countries, especially Bangladesh. Iron. It might surprise you that that is probably uh, an element that is deficient in about half of the world population, particularly younger people and women. And you might say, well, why? Uh, most of the soil has about 2 or 3% iron. It's a huge uh, percentage, relatively, in the soil, but it's not available. There's only a very tiny fraction of that that can be taken up by the plant. Now, I've worked for years on zinc, and zinc is important for so many processes in, in terms of human health, but globally, it's very deficient. And it's, uh, some crops, like wheat, are very low in zinc. You don't, if you're depending on, on wheat alone, you don't get enough zinc in your system. Now, if you have pulses or you have meat, you solve that problem. There's a place in Egypt, Fayum, and virtually everybody there, they eat the wheat and the, the vegetables from there are deficient in zinc. Okay, um, zinc in the past, it was strange that it was added to a soil here, to a superphosphate. And people didn't know that because there's a large... Uh, percentage of it in the superphosphate, but as the fertilizer became purer, they got rid of the zinc. So it's becoming an emerging problem. There's a scientist in Turkey, he's done a lot of work for many years, and he's come up with adding zinc to the, the fertilizer, and it has a huge impact. They estimate that the benefit to the society was $300 million. Asbestos, uh, that now we all know it's in uh, insulation material and so on. But it's a natural thing. There are many minerals, uh, asbestos minerals. I have a story about, I have a friend who's a geology professor in Las Vegas. And she discovered that all the soil is very rich in, in that. She tried to publish a paper about that with a doctor friend. And she got a knock on her door from the president of the university and said, hey, you can't publish that. Because if that information got out with the dust in Las Vegas and that valley, um, uh, the, the casino people and the developers, they would not be very happy at all. So there is uh, an economic interest there in contrast to the scientific one. Okay, uh, there's a, a, a sub-discipline in the health called geophagy. And uh, now that's people eating, eating soil to one form or the other. And I have a, uh, a statement here. Every person has eaten soil in one form or another. We have spinach, eat it, and there's dust in it. We get dust into our system. But this was, uh, comes from geo, earth, and fag to eat in Greek. Uh, this was a deliberate attempt by people to get elements into them. They didn't know why, but they knew if they took it, it was good for them. The Egyptians, the Romans, uh, the Greeks, all had the practice of like, getting tablets or um, aspirin, of taking uh, soil in lozenges, some of them, and the people would, would, would uh, think that it's better for the liver, the, and so anemia 
especially iron is essential for anemia. In, in Kenya and Zambia and places like that, you'll find it in, in local markets they will be selling soil. Kaolinite is one of the minerals uh, that it absorbs, it takes poison from the system. It's part of this kaopectate, which has another function as well. Um, and they, so soil can de detoxify food. Okay, the, uh, I have a note here about the aboriginals in Australia. Uh, they were depending on the local produce, and uh, the survey showed every one of them were low in zinc. Okay, uh, I mentioned here about animals. Uh, they instinctively know if they're lacking in something, and that's hence salt lakes for animals. But we humans, we don't have that uh, in, innate intuition. Okay. And it might surprise us about soil that it's a source of antibiotics. Uh, the bacteria and the fungi and the, uh, the, the actinomyces, they produce streptomycin. Uh, that was discovered uh, in the 1940s uh, by Selman Waxman. He was a microbiologist. Got the Nobel Prize for it. Came from soil. Uh, penicillin was discovered by Fleming, by accident. There are many others, a whole range of them that come from the soil. I said here only 20% of the organisms, that, of the millions of them in the soil, have yet to be identified. What are the negative effects of soil? Dust causes a whole range of diseases. At one stage, I, one doctor diagnosed me as uh, having valley fever. I didn't know what it, what it was. I was in the United States, and he said it came from the dust. Uh, fortunately, it worked its way out of the system. And that, so can a valley fever, anthrax, tetanus, uh, from clostridial, clostridial bacteria, leprosy, biblical connotations, and our stomach parasites. So the soil, uh, not a good idea to, to eat it. Uh, then comes the soil, the radon gas. This is something that's occurring naturally. Now we note here, most antibacterial agents originated in the soil, 81%. Uh, 40% of prescription drugs. 60% of new cancer drugs. Okay, get close now. So there, there's an awful lot written about soil and culture. Now, in, in the Stone Age, uh, paintings in, in this uh, Lisu in, in, in France, that cave, uh, all this ochre and red, this comes from the soil. So people use the, the color of soil minerals to... Okay, okay sorry. Um, there was this uh, painter, Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, he, he used the... Uh, he had a painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, and he shows people cultivating the soil, plowing the soil. In archaeology, and the, the cultural aspects now, uh, you can sample areas where people lived, and the longer they lived at a particular level in, in, in the habitation, the more phosphorus you had. Because why? From the burning of the ashes. So we can provide signatories, or, uh, signatures uh, from soils to identify what has happened in historical past. Uh, there's another aspect of it on stamps. If we, if we try to get an insight to history through stamps, uh, the Portuguese had stamps on soil profiles. Darwin, known for his uh, evolution of the species, uh, he actually was a soil scientist as well. Uh, he observed the profiles, and a stamp came out with a, a profile with him. Liebig from Germany, uh, he had a picture of him on, on the stamp with the NPK. Uh, Dokuchayev, the man that described soils in Russia, uh, the ruble and the kopeck stamps were in his honor. I had a friend in Turkey, and he was an expert on clay and on pottery. And there's an, another one on the, in this cultural domain, soil and warfare. And the, one of the statements says, the uh, soil caused Failure uh, and modified the outcome of military conflicts. You might recall after the Iranian Revolution uh, and the capture of the hostages, uh, G uh, Jimmy Carter sent in helicopters. They went down. It was a total failure because of the dust. 
the, the helicopters were destroyed. Uh, going back to the Crusades, uh, the knights that were going over there to liberate the, the Holy Land, um, they had this heavy armor. Well, they came back, uh, they jettisoned the armor because it weighed them down in the heavy soils when it rained in the Middle East. And the horses were, were stuck in it. You might have seen this uh, movie, Passchendaele. It says that more people died at Passchendaele from actually being stuck in the mud because of the atrocious weather condition and the the soil that wasn't suitable. It's interesting that in wet soil, the people get stuck, but also uh, it pointed out that when the shells came in, they landed and went straight into the soil and didn't explode. When you had this artillery on soil that was unstable, you fired off, the gun went in the, in the other direction because the ground was not solid enough. So if you look then, the soil or the, the, the location of battles had a very important outcome of the, the battle. Now, about manures and fertilization. We all accept now that we fertilize crops, whether it's fertilizer or the organic thing, manures. Uh, but there is a society in the world that said, no, 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 we won't use manures. And that's the Maori in New Zealand. And they were afraid that they would insult the goddess of Mother Earth. Okay, from at the end. Now, what are the future challenges? I could go on and on about uh, these various aspects, just to give you an insight. What are the future challenges to uh, food production, to our existence as, as human beings? And, and one is phosphorus. Not many people know about this, but 10 years ago, everybody was talking about peak phosphorus. Well, the reality is there's only about 400 years left of this. And it comes from a few countries in the world, Morocco, some in, in the United States and in Russia. And that is essential to life. It's, it's essential to plants growing, to all our biological functions in us. Nothing can replace it. And so it's not oil, it's phosphorus. And nitrogen fixation. I think it will be the greatest achievement, greatest breakthrough in the um, history of, of science if we can come about taking this nitrogen from the atmosphere, working with geneticists. Uh, so we won't need commercial fertilizers anymore. It would be a lot more efficient if we incorporate it with the plant. Precision agriculture. Uh, this is a, a new development. Instead of, of um, throwing everything, we do it. Uh, we use technology to precisely apply fertilizer where it's needed. And so there's a whole area built up around this. Pollution. I think we've got to live with that. Now we're faced with this plastic around the world. Well, I'm a great believer in what Al Gore says, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And his inconvenient truth. Uh, Bioremediation. Uh, there's a, an, an area of soils where they're growing plants on toxic dumps to take the materials from that. And you take it and get it out of the soil. Urbanization is a challenge to us. As we build cities, uh, and we, we're burying soil on the concrete. I saw a figure recently that if you put all the urban area together in, um, in the United States, it would fit into the state of Ohio, which is a huge state. So we are putting land, burying land in concrete. And as far as we're concerned, that is forever. Now, there's a new, and the good news, of course, is there's a new focus on sustainability. That term wasn't used more than 30 years ago. But sustainability, what does it mean? Using land, using it wisely, so that it's the same as, or not worse, in the future. We must, I'm not a, a very religious person, but I'm a spiritual person in some sense. Uh, we've got to treat soil, like the ancients, as something sacred. Not like the Americans, and they don't really mean it, but it's dirt. It's not dirt. It's essential to our life and our survival. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan, a very famous uh, person uh, in the, for the Green Revolution, he says, I quote, to feed nine billion people on Earth's finite resources, we must draw on the infinite capacity of human beings to learn, adapt, and to find solutions. Ourselves education, science, that will come to the rescue. I have a note to myself that 
in many other areas, we have spokespeople uh, in the movie industry and so on. And in geography, we have David Attenborough to publicize uh, science. Soil science does need a David Attenborough. Uh, some generic challenges uh, here that I mentioned. In an age of tweet, Wikipedia, and fake news, truth is often a casualty. And we see that in, in the media today. With the emancipation of the uninformed, we need to question the democratic notion that one man's ignorance is equal to another, another science and fact-based fact knowledge. In other words, we have people having opinions with no basis whatsoever. Anyone can have an opinion, and that's as good as somebody who is the expert. You can leave it to yourself to know on what side uh, you uh, come down on. Uh, also, one challenge in science is kind of historical amnesia. That we don't look back as, at what people did before. And we need to look back uh, to see what they did to build a future. I, I think most people are preoccupied with the present rather than the past. I, had, I read this morning a very uh, disheartening uh, statement from the States from the American Society of Agronomy, and says, U.S. scientists are virtually invisible to the public. In other words, the average person on the street doesn't know anything about what scientists do. 81% of Americans could not name a single living scientist. That's pretty sad. Uh, but we have to end on a positive note. I was reading the feature article in Time magazine this week by Bill Gates, none other, and, and he had a very positive view of all the technologies and that he, he said, yeah, we're, we're okay. We can get uh, and, on top of AIDS and, and so on in the world. We can solve it. And I guess he's saying that because he has a grasp of what's the reality, what is our human capability. Now, we could end... Uh, by various kinds of statements, but I think an, an appropriate one uh, to end is a, a quotation from Mahatma Gandhi. And he said, the earth has enough for everybody, but not enough for everybody's greed. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, I think everybody will really be uh, annoyed by the faces of humanity. Everybody was in charge for the last hour. And give them the last big time while we're waiting around. So I think it's a testament to John and the quality of what he has said. So I will open it up to the floor. Any questions? Any questions to John? You got an off light. I don't want to go there. I thought I'd talk nice and loud. <coughs> yes, um, there's, you mentioned that one point about nutrient density in foods and so on. and it kind of brings to mind the kind of complexity of it in a way because you know if you if you feed a plant with more nitrogen and more phosphorus and more potassium it will give you more output but the density of the output on the particular grain or the particular strawberry or whatever it is you're growing you may just have more you know you may, you may have less of, 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 of the other constituents that you might need in the food in there if you were to here are you disproportionately pushing things to, towards one side by concentrating, you know, on the nutrients? You know, it, it doesn't make any the other constituents of it. it doesn't make any sense to put more nutrients than will get the maximum growth of the crop. So you don't want extra potassium in the crop, extra nitrogen because you have too much leaf. So I agree with you. 100%. So it, it doesn't make any sense for the farmer or the producer to uh, put on fertilizers that's going to be wasted. So, you're right. Well, it is a very complex thing. I, I didn't intend to address that in any detailed it's sense, but just to cover the broad aspects dealing with soil. So, this is the part of the serious alternative from my old part. Yeah. It used up all the slurry, the store of Yeah. You'd imagine to make it That's it. Presumably, it's the The problem is, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
on the on the server. John, yes, yes, yes. I'm always curious to see how that grass seems to keep on growing. The grass leaves the decision to make a green chlorophyll, which is magnesium based. Yeah. There seems to be an endless supply of magnesium in the soil. There isn't. And when in some places, uh, uh, where you have limestone as a permanent material, you will have uh, magnesium. And in the part of the world that I worked in, in the south of the United States, southwest, and the Middle East, uh, you always have calcium and magnesium. So you never have a case of deficiency there. You'll only have deficiency where you have high rainfall and kind of acid soil condition to rainfall that gradually over the years washes it out of the top uh, six inches or so. But it, 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 I know nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus are essential, but no, no one seems to mention calcium or magnesium as an additive to soil. Well, in the, they, they are important. Mm. But when you line now, I mentioned that in the 50s and 60s, uh, there was a lot of lime that was promoted here. Uh, you're adding calcium and magnesium. So was lime promoted with the pH, just in pH rather than as an, uh, a mineral? Is it? No, no, it, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a kind of complex thing, but it raises the pH, but it does supply calcium and magnesium. Okay. It dolomite is a particular form of, of uh, lime dolomite, which is as much calcium carbonate as magnesium carbonate. John? Has John a view on, on ploughing versus uh, direct cultivation? Which? Yeah, I, I might, well, the, the, the gentleman who is the expert is back there. John, would you like to comment on ploughing? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> the wise man. But again, there are, if, if you don't, if you minimize ploughing, the experience in the United States has been that you lose, use less energy by, and you have the same crop. That has been the experience. Most of the crop in the United States, the corn and soybeans, is all with the red yeah, yeah. I, I suppose maybe going back to one of the points that you raised there in the, in the United States situation, that a lot of soils have lost 50% of their organic matter. A lot of tillage soils in Ireland in terms of organic matter content, they're at 50% of what the equivalent soil under grassland would be. And that's in the next uh, or nearby field. So we, we actually do have, even if we do have relatively high soil organic matter content in our soils, we do have an issue in our tillage soils in this country. And it's one of the things that we do badly need to address. You know, I, I think uh, we have over mechanized crop production in the sense that we overly intensively cultivate soil and it's costing farmers a lot of money directly in terms of machinery costs but also uh, indirectly in terms of extra nutrition costs in the form of fertilizer which you mentioned as well but it's um, there's a very strong traditional and cultural thing to tell you in Ireland and that's going to be a very difficult um, barrier to break down, but we're, we're moving there piece by piece. You know. I was involved in a study in the Middle East, in Syria, and we had some person who specialized in agronomy and mechanization, and they had an experiment there with conventional tail plowing and all of this, and a direct tail drill. Yields were the same over a 10 year period, virtually every year, very dependent on the rainfall. But what the difference was, the economic one, the costs were less uh, with the direct drill and the minimum tillage. Yields are the same, but the cost of inputs were less. Yes, this might be on the way. I have to say, it's bad. We have glyphosate, which is uh, cultivation. Mm -hmm. It's glyphosate and bone oil. <laughs> I knew that this was going to come up. <laughs> but I personally, uh, I personally have no problem with. In the past, why didn't people cultivate the, the soil and all that? It's to get rid of weeds. Yeah. Glyphosate is the most effective. It's been used for about 50 years in the United States, and I personally don't see any problem. I see no solid evidence of glyphosate affecting anybody. I think it's a political thing. And even, 
It's no one perception. It's no one perception. Exactly. Yes. yes. But if it were, listen, if it were, it's the most used chemical in the world, if it were harmful and it was used for 50 years in the United States, it would be very obvious if there was a health problem. Right? Yes. What's the movie that directive? A soil directive. Yeah. directive. Yeah. 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 Oh, it is, but where you have a drought conditions and you don't have an appropriate uh, management of, of the landscape. And this is happening in the Middle East. Can it be counteracted? Well, I mentioned that if you read about the Dust Bowl, what they have done there, they, what they did was wonderful. They, had, uh, they planted millions of trees against the wind. They did contour planting. They, uh, got out of agriculture in soils that were on the areas that were very vulnerable uh, to desertification. So you can do something about it. But you just must understand the system and your environment. You must understand the rainfall and the temperature you know, and the likelihood of drought. And we can predict uh, reasonably well quality of things. Just the last question, I don't know the science are done on that you made many think of my grandchildren. Um, there is only up to 400 years left of the planet. So how do we promote more of that? How do we keep it? What should we do? Like, how come it's going to be gone in 400 years? It, it is because uh, we have been, we know the geologists will tell us um, where it is. And I, I've been to Morocco and I've been to these sites and I came across uh, a, a survey by the US, USDA of all the resources in the world. They can tell you where, where they are. There are only a few countries have them, and they know how much is left, and they know what concentrations are in that rock. So at the prices, see, when the price goes up, then you can uh, delve into the, the, the tailings, what is left. It pays you to get the rock and, and work it. It's a very complex process. But what they are doing at the economic level, uh, in crop management, they are being a lot more precise in direct drilling, putting the fertilizer near the, near the seed, instead of scattering it all, all, all over. And there's a big movement now to take uh, phosphorus from sewage and all the waste products kind of recycled. Lots and lots of paper published on, on that. So that is positive. But the reality is that we have very limited, in human terms, very limited amounts of phosphorus for the future. We have to be aware of that. And we have to recycle it in as much as possible. But people like to talk about that. There was a, a lot of uh, political controversy when these papers came out about peak phosphorus. That's the same with, with oil. We don't want to that too. We don't want it. Uh, if something in the future, we don't want to think about it. Okay. I have to stand up, ladies and gentlemen. John is a very good neighbor and a very good friend of mine. And I came here, I have decided I'm saying nothing. But I have to say something about the last topic, round up. Yes, yeah, please. Cheer, round up. Glyphosate. There is this. Glyphosate is the best selling um, oh, Jesus. spray in the world. And the people making it have unlimited money and ways to suppress any research which shows what shite they sell. It's coming out here and there. Why did two and a half million people in Germany vote against glyphosate? There is big, big money behind And nobody knows. The 50 years are there, but the research is there. But it's, we, it is proven that Monsanto, for instance, falsified their research. The papers they submitted for approval. 
it is one of the most controversial things. And when I can say and one thing to you, please don't spray in front of your garden or the pots and things like that. <coughs> there are different ways. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, I, well, I appreciate your, your opinion, Richard, but I, I'm not an expert. I didn't mention this in my lecture tonight. Okay, there are all the people. Uh, John Garrity knows a lot more than I do about it. This is off my area of science, right? But as a kind of informed layman, I have to say, well, I don't see it. I haven't seen it. Uh, I've asked physiologists and people who should know. I have a good friend in Canada, John O'Donovan, worked for years with Canada Agriculture. I said, John, just tell me, give me the evidence. Do you, is anyone dying from that? Is any health effects? Just, do you have it? Do you, he's not, he wasn't working for Monsanto, never did. He's a physiologist and I worked with that. And he said, no. He said, I, I said, I see no problem. But logically, if there is a problem and somebody's using this thing for 50 years, the biggest chemical in the world surely would see symptoms all over the place. I don't see the evidence. That's what I'm saying. With it. I'd love to see the evidence. And it's amazing how many... I'll tell you a story uh, about how people have strong opinions on things without faith in facts. Uh, it's very important. Now, you may have your facts about the companies and, and so on. I did a study on pesticides in Arizona years and years ago for a master's degree in education. And I, in the questionnaire, I assessed the knowledge of people. And I surveyed an urban group and a rural group. And basically, what do you think of, of the various insecticides and pesticides? And I found there was an inverse relationship. The less people knew about the toxicity of the stuff, the technical matters, the lower this was, the stronger their opinions were about the, the particular thing. I'm not saying that case in your case at all, but it is ironic that you'll find in many cases people have very strong opinions on things. Well, it, it's fine with people's uh, right, but it has to be based on evidence, facts. As a scientist, I always say, show me the facts. The DDT in the forest. Huh? So 50 years technology. Yeah, DDT was, in fact, I was with, uh, uh, I was in a laboratory, and the man was an expert on DDT, and he said he actually eat the thing. DDT in itself wasn't a toxic thing, but it was a, its effect on the environment, on birds, shells, but not on the human being. I mean, our bodies are full of chemicals. Look at anything you buy in the store and 25, 30 different chemicals added to it. We are chemicals. We can't escape them. We want to get rid of them, the bad ones. And I have to say, would the school of glycosin kill you? Huh? Would the school of glycosin kill you? I'm not going to take it, but I know it's been very effective for me, but I, I think it's important that you, everybody has their opinion. Well, you know, that's, that's my opinion, based on a look for evidence. Surely like any poison, it has to do with concentration, the level of it. Right? That's the whole base of poison, it's all about the level of it. Because, you know, too much salt will kill you, not enough salt will also kill in the diet. Okay, I think we might, are we okay to wrap it up? It's 5 past 10, we have a very good evening, and because based on the number of, of questions, I felt that I had to call at some stage, there was quite more questions coming. So I will just, again, thank John for what he has done, and a very good lecture, and we hope to see you all again um, in, is it the 14th February, uh, David? 1st of February. 1st of February, David Power is going to do a very different subject, also interesting. England and Europe in the time of Shakespeare's plays. Because we set the context for that. So that is on. Also, our annual subscription for those who, want, who wish to be members is that uh, we can, you can look at, you can be, um, Catherine Darcy, take any subscriptions you want. Okay, so, safe home and thanks again. Thank you all.